right, good evening, folks. This is the regular meeting of council for Tuesday, May the 23rd. Hope everybody had a wonderful long weekend. We heard that was record-breaking for temperatures. So uh, it was about time, I think 1999 was the last time we had this kind of a, a weather break on a May long weekend. So it uh, doesn't come by very often. Uh, looking for approval of the agenda? So moved. Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Public participation. Opportunity for members of the public to speak to council. Microphone is there. We'd like to hear from you. Nope. Well, nobody wants to talk Everybody tonight. Stay in your seats. <laughs> Um, all right, we shall move on then to Mayor's message. Um, long weekend, like I said, was a scorcher. There are a number of announcements and, and um, uh, things to go over here. Uh, first of all, thanks to Councillor Chong for attending the World Partnership Walk that will be held May 28th um, and representing the City of Colwood. Uh, next on the list is we recently had our um, community cleanup and just wanted to make note for anybody that's interested here we had 543 vehicles coming through public works there were a total of approximately fourteen thousand dollars collected that goes to offset costs for recycling and disposal of the materials we took in all kinds of things old appliances furniture toys car parts wood waste etc uh, a lot of things were being recycled. One person comes in to drop off one thing and leaves with a bunch of other stuff. So uh, it was just <laughs> kind of an exchange program out there, but that works for, for us at the end of the day. Uh, everybody leaves happy, and thanks to all of those who partake in it because it helps to keep the city clean and that kind of stuff off of the boulevards and street corners with free signs on them. Um, there is also, and there is a, a, a notification that we've received, but there's also a, an article in the Gazette on the increasing um, situation of um, women and children mostly being affected by abuses, and a lot of this is coming online, so uh, read the article on sexting online. Um, these are social media situations, uh, and we are trying to do our best on raising the awareness. There are a number of events happening over the next while. Unfortunately, most of these are in Vancouver, so um, information will be posted on our website for anybody that's interested. I know that the Youth and Family Court Committee works very diligently to spread the word on this, and Councillor Day is, is uh, all over it, so um, it's happening. I have, and I think there's probably enough. It is uh, Bachelor Button Month coming up in June, uh, the corn, also known as Cornflowers in support of ALS. Uh, we have done our annual uh, recognition of June as ALR, uh, ALS Awareness Month. And to note, the Ice Bucket Challenge from a few years ago, $20 million raised in research, uh, and they found a new gene that is connected to ALS, so they're doing further work on research with that. June 3rd, National Health and Fitness Day, says Senator Nancy Green Rain. Uh, we have been challenged to get out in the community and do something uh, in particular on in support of our Canada 150, but uh, National Health and Fitness Day is on the calendar. Oceans Day is coming June the 8th. And usually they ask for a proclamation, which we have done in the past, but this year they're actually asking for awareness. So this is uh, an opportunity that we can take. Things like cigarette butts kill fish and diminish water quality. They have tested it that the study revealed one cigarette butt soaked in a liter of water for one day resulted in diminished water quality and the death of 50% of fish therein. Um, there's a number of things that can be done, everybody taking their part, uh, you know, even garbage cans near waterfronts to making sure that they have lids on them so plastic bits aren't blowing off and into water. Um, and that's also tied into the sea, Salish Sea Heritage um, petition that was put through April 30th uh, in regards to trying 
to get designation for the Salish Sea as a her World Heritage Site. Another June event coming up <coughs> for all you dads in, the, in there, and, and uh, I'd like to see um, what we can do. I know we've got Sandra working on it, but um, Plaid for Dad, it's a prostate cancer awareness program, and so they're saying asking that folks, you know, dress in plaid in in uh, recognition on Father's Day, June the 16th. Uh, snap a photo and upload it wearing plaid so that they can celebrate on social media. Uh, hashtag plaid for dad. So we'll get that information out there. You're already ready for it. Well, I think uh, staff have a kilt or two in the closet that could come out. Um, June the 21st, the public library at uh, West Shore Parks and Rec will be closed in recognition of Staff Day. So don't be returning your books that day because there'll be nobody there to receive them. Um, also recognition for our emergency planning. Um, folks held the uh, emergency planning fair on May the 7th. They estimated 1,000 to 1,200 people through there. This is the 10th year that they've been doing it there at, at West Shore Parks and Rec. And it was a fun time with all the displays and a little bit of interaction that they had going on. Um, and finally, coming out, uh, I don't know, this is like a, a public announcement here. Yeah, Royal it Roads, is it is now. <laughs> Royal Roads University, in conjunction with the Victoria Military Music Festival Society, has um, established a two day show on the uh, Canada 150 musical ride tour. So I imagine that'll be down on the parade grounds of Royal Roads. Um, so it says to check the RCMP website um, and it will give updated information, but you heard it first before it even hit the TC. Um, anybody else, council wise? I think we're. Councilor Dave? Thanks. Uh, um, I'm not sure if you may have covered it. I might have missed it, but I just want to let you know that um, in the most recent letter we've received from Kathy Peters, who um, has been working hard to inform everyone about uh, sex trafficking in British Columbia and Canada, um, has sent out uh, her latest uh, uh, update, uh, and there is a um, a special talk being held on this Friday morning at the Vancouver Club with City in Focus, a panel presentation on human sex trafficking from s 7 till 9 in the morning. And the Victoria Family Court is sending Melissa Highland of uh, Resiliency Rising uh, and the Capital Region Action Team for Sexually Exploited Youth to attend that talk on, on our behalf. And I'll bring you back whatever information I can that could be helpful. Great, thank you. That was that little part about the meetings in Vancouver part. Um, with that, looking for adoption of minutes uh, of a number of meetings, regular meeting of council April 24th, regular meeting of council May 8th, regular meeting council February 27th, where the minutes were amended, um, public hearing minutes of May 16th. Move adoption, your worship. Second. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carried. Receipt please, for a number of minutes as well. Emergency Planning Committee, January 17th. Planning and Land Use, May 2nd. And the report of the public hearing, May 16th. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Mm -hmm. uh, just as, as a clarification, 4.1.3 uh, to staff, do we need to rescind it of the March 13th and then adopt? Or are we good with just adopting the way we did it? Through you, Madam Mayor, I do think the best process would be for Council to rescind the adoption, the March 13th adoption of the February 27th minutes. Um, we didn't realize that a, par a portion of the approved Council motion for the item mentioned on the agenda um, only showed bullet A, and there's actually a bullet A, B, and C to the resolution. So when staff went to actually take the action related to that topic item, that's when we realized, and because the minutes were adopted without it and have been signed off, um, we think the best approach would be for us to 
rescind that adoption and adopt them tonight as amended as shown in the package. So we'll be backing up to 4.1.3 for the regular meeting council uh, February 27th motion to rescind the March 13th resolution. Correct. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Motion to adopt February 27th as amended. So moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. And right. we have now to 4.3. Uh, which is a presentation from Royal Roads University Environmental Science Student Project, City of Colwood Climate Score. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> and just before council gets started, I don't know on your iPads, but there was nothing that showed up <coughs> on mine, so there, it is loaded on our overheads. You might have it in hard copy, but... Yeah, it'll be in the hard copy. Yeah. Th thank you, Worship. I'll, I'll just... Uh, introduce I see in the agenda there's a bit of a quick introduction uh, from me um, keep it really quick um, so tonight we've got res uh, representatives of dr. Chris Ling's environmental science and land use uh, planning class from Royal Roads it's a bachelor of uh, science program uh, that uh, we've been working um, with staff to undertake the build out of a tool uh, designed to measure the climate impacts of new developments um, so staff uh, started this work some time ago and uh, been struggling to, um, with all our priorities right now, to um, put work towards it. So the um, students in this class have, have offered to, as I said, build it out and uh, hopefully uh, be, we'll be in a position to bring it forward uh, as part of a package of options for council, um, part and parcel with our new official community plan to take a more rigorous and uh, professional look at uh, the climate impacts of new developments. So this tool would be um, part of the analysis when new applications come before council. So with that, I'll uh, uh, give it to the group. Thanks. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, can I click with this? Can hear me? Thanks for the introduction. Um, as Ian mentioned, we're, we're students of Royal Roads University. Our professor, Dr. Ling, tasked us with, with assisting with the creation of this tool. We think it's a really really positive idea and it could be a very proactive way to to reduce greenhouse gas emissions <coughs> the work that's been completed thus far is a combination of the original the original tool we got and essentially ongoing research by the class for for about a month now it's been a very dynamic process of, of uh, looking at the original categories the original the original input and ensuring the the research is there and the background is there to support them and then maybe introduce some other categories that we feel are important. Reason being is, is, to, is to really capture the heavy hitters in terms of greenhouse gas emissions as far as developments go. The purpose is, uh, is really to, to create something that was fairly accurate, encompassed everything we wanted to, but at the same time was, was really simplistic to use, again, for the purpose being that, that developers themselves, themselves could really assess their own, their own proposals. This is an example of, uh, of the current state. It has inputs on the left-hand side. You can see categories running down in the green, and each category is assessed a rating. The ratings are essentially what, what our research entails. The rating system is, is described on the right. So each category would look at its rating system and then be allotted a score based on how it fits, based on how the development actually is assessed in terms of for example, something along the lines of energy usage. How much of the energy of the of the development is proposed to be offset by by other by other methods? Once all the categories are completed, an overall compli uh, climate score is is created. The higher the score, the lower the greenhouse gas emissions. Kind of counterintuitive to what you think, but the higher the score, the better in this case. We're going to start explaining now some of the categories to you. There is uh, six categories we currently have. Some have multiple indicators, which breaks them down a little further in terms of how they're assessed. Transportation is one. We also have uh, building materials that the, that the development will be composed of. Transportation, actually, I should say, is, is in regards to how you get to and from that location. Um, another one is energy usage, projected energy usage, energy sources of the, of the development. 
as well as as well as lifestyle, which we'll we'll kind of dive into. It's kind of not clear what that is, but I'm just going to not. Um, transportation really is assessed based on the locations or the developments, encouragement or discouragement of different forms of getting to and from. Um, those being being able to walk, being able to take public transit, or encouraging the use of a personal vehicle. Um, there's also another category which doesn't encompass those main three, which kind of includes things like cycling or ride sharing or use of electric vehicles. So currently, if you have a walkability score or a transit score of greater than 70, that's really good news. Uh, you, you'd earn a point for that. Reason being is most trips can be made uh, when, you're at a, when you're at a score of that or higher using without using a personal vehicle. You can walk to your destination. You can take public transit to your destination. We had a difficult time kind of coming up with a scoring scheme for whether development encourages or discourages use of a personal vehicle. Our research says, not surprisingly, that people use a vehicle because it's convenient to do so. So we really tried to establish how a development would be convenient or inconvenient to drive. What we came up with is whether it supplies parking stalls in relation to the original space. So if the development um, changes the existing space and reduces the amount of parking stalls, thus making it less convenient to drive, it's rewarded for that. Uh, an example would be turning a parking lot into something that's more mixed use that is very, very good as far as environmental emissions go and reducing things. Um, the alternative options I mentioned, anything along the lines of encouraging biking, ride sharing, or using electric vehicles, so creating cycling lanes, having a uh, stall paved that just dedicated solely to, to ride sharing, or an electric charging station would also, you know, also be valuable and, and reduce the overall emissions of that development. Um, for further explanation of the categories, I'll pass you to Dale now. Thank you, Andy. All right, so one of the uh, prominent uh, indicators for greenhouse gases that our class uh, discussed in terms of landscape development uh, is the change in the number of trees. Uh, so what trees do is they sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and they store it in the cellulose and the lignin uh, in the tree. And what we know is that young trees uh, sequester carbon or CO2 faster and that older trees uh, are able to store more. Uh, so what this breaks down to is that when we remove a tree or cut a tree down from the property, we're releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, so when scoring this on our scale, um, we've kind of leaned towards the side of promoting preservation and conservation. Um, so you'll notice that you actually get a score of four for no net change in the number of trees. And this is set like this in order to recognize the, uh, how difficult it is to develop on land without removing any trees at all. Um, moving forward, we'll look at uh, another component of our climate score is the uh, source of energy. And uh, with this, we've used the uh, BC Hydro and uh, Fortis BC as uh, preliminary markers. Um, so you'll notice that they are, uh, they would be a score of, of one, which that's not to say that those are bad sources of energy, um, but the scoring here was designed in order to uh, look for long-term long, long -term, uh, goals. So what we've used is the uh, BC 2050 Climate Change Action Plan, uh, which says to reduce 2007 levels by 80%. Um, and the indicator here is the energy use offset percentage. So what developers are able to do is use green technologies, which have to be located on site and uh, create a lower CO2 equivalence than what they already are using. And they supplement these green energies uh, with the, the standard energies, and that's how they get their percentage scoring. Uh, some examples of um, on-site green technology would be geothermal, so, uh, solar power, and passive buildings. Uh, next, I'll talk about uh, electricity and water usage. So this is energy usage um, as opposed to the source of energy. Um, in order to assess uh, energy usage, we looked at a bunch of certifications that are already in existence, um, locally and worldwide, actually. And one of the major problems was that although these, these certifications were really good, we weren't able to set them on any scale of ranking. Um, but what we did want to do is uh, recognize certifications, or to not to not, not recognize certifications. So we wanted to include them in, as you can see, in uh, category two there. 
Um, we wanted to include the R2000, which is an insulation rating, uh, the energy guide, which is energy efficiency and energy loss due to construction, and then the passive house, which is um, more related to the energy and efficiency of the design of the house. And then from there, we found um, that it was actually LEED certifications that were best able, we were best able to use in terms, because they just encompassed everything um, within the building. Uh, examples of this, in terms of water efficiency, is that it would, it would include uh, indoor consumption, so toilets, um, kitchens, dishwashers, showers. Uh, it would also encompass uh, irrigation. Um, water meter usage was required, and also included a, a cooling water tower. And then another, some more examples for energy efficiency. Um, we focused on five, LEED focuses on five main categories. They would talk about advanced energy metering, uh, refrigerant management, uh, enhanced commissioning, and then a demand response, as well as optimized performance, so uh, low emissivity uh, windows and uh, high thermal resistance values, so insulation in your attics and your walls. Um, and then even concluded with talking a bit about uh, the tankless water heaters as well. Um, now I'll pass it to Chris to continue on. Uh, for the materials category, research was conducted which gave us evidence that the materials utilized by a development can be traced to greenhouse gas emissions in a variety of ways. The materials are a integral part of the overall energy efficiency of a building. The source of the materials and how they're transported to the site of the development can also contribute greenhouse gases to that product. These were considered as indicators as well as the one included on the screen here. This refers to the manufacturing processes of the materials. General purposes are listed on the side, and then ranked one to five is the processes that at five have fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and at one, relatively more. The lifestyle category led to some interesting conversations about a developer's ability and responsibility to influence the usage of the building. Possible indicators that we considered were waste management and divergence, heating and cooling systems. We lost half the slide here. There's also capability for multi-use, the density of use, and the building's purpose overall. Going forward, we're going to focus on the last three. Capability for multi-use involves research into how a building's design can increase the varieties of functions that it can fulfill, reducing the overall need of more development and more buildings in the community. Uh, the density of use is going to be scoring developments on how many units per area of land. And that is linked to research that suggests more compact communities have fewer greenhouse gas emissions. And the building purposes is justified through the energy usage analysis of general building categories, such as residential, hospitals, schools, et cetera. Throughout the conversations that we've had as a class about this project and similar tools, we've come up with a few interesting points every time. We realize that this concept is in its infancy at the moment, but if it does have success or interest in the future, we have some recommendations to go along with it. Uh, the first refers to using greenhouse gas emissions as the be all and all indi indicator of environmental impacts. We found this limited some of our conversations when we wanted to discuss riparian zones, habitat loss, and other characteristics of sustainability. Uh, but as someone in our class did say, if that's not an indicator for the climate score, perhaps it could be an indicator for the sustainability score, the habitat loss score, et cetera. Um, another point that was a bit of an obstacle for us was that this is a tool created for developers to fill out at a certain point in the development process. And we had to simplify a fairly complex, complex natural cycle to succeed at this. Um, but we're scientists and we love throwing numbers. We think it makes everything better. So we think that in the future, quantitative measurements could be added along with these descriptive indicators that we're discussing for a more impactful score overall. Uh, the last point is a topic of a future class discussion of ours. And that involves the overall weightings that Andy discussed previously. Uh, our class consensus at the moment is we're either going to get rid of the weightings or fix them in place. When we were first presented with the score, it was enabled that they could be edited at the moment. Uh, we would like to discourage any untoward 
alterations that might change the overall score. And we feel that we can come up with research that would back up fixed weightings relative to each category's overall greenhouse gas emissions. That being said, we're very excited that environmental impacts, including those of greenhouse gas emissions, are part of the conversation in Colwood. Uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to partner with the city. Uh, I'd like to invite you guys to ask any questions and my teammates to help me answer them. Turn that to council for questions. Anyone? Thank you. Uh, so I've got a couple uh, for you. The first is uh, the overall score. Um, do you guys have a benchmark or do you guys have something that developers should be aspiring towards? So what number should they be wor working towards trying to get? 100%. Well, <laughs> I was just say, that, ain't, that ain't happening. <laughs> I believe the tool was proposed to us as a communication tool. So okay. when council or whoever is considering multiple development projects, they just have a, a relative number to check, hmm, I wonder which one's better for the client. That burning question. And that'll be something to consult with that. Uh, my second question is, uh, one, of, one of the examples you used was looking at reducing parking spots. And I understand how that, I understand the philosophy behind what you're talking about from a, G, uh, from a, a mission standpoint. How does this fit in from an economic impact standpoint? When you start suggesting certain things that could impact a developer negatively, how, um, how, how do you address that? I'll pass this one to Andy. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a very good question. There are, there are a ton of limitations that, that we've kind of identified that we didn't bother kind of explaining here. This, this solely looks at greenhouse gas emissions. It does not incorporate any sort of economic impact. That, no, that's it. That's all I got. Councillor Day? I'm just uh, curious if you looked at, uh, for a comparison, it's, it's not strictly about greenhouse gas. It's more about sustainability in the UK uh, in order to develop in some of the rural areas. Uh, I forget it's called like Code 6 uh, or Plan 6. Um, they have a very stringent... Um, uh, set of requirements for, for builders to achieve in order to uh, be able to attain their occupancy permits. Uh, and did you compare at all with what they're doing in the UK? I haven't. Well, we did from a transportation standpoint. That's where a lot of the really, really good input came out of. Uh, I don't know if you guys did it that way, but it's passed along to the class that if it's something that hasn't been incorporated, we'll certainly have a look at it and see what we're and uh, just a suggestion, um, uh, having been uh, around um, a lot of uh, different government programs over the years have, have been targeted towards, as you said, the R2000 house with the increased uh, insulation, uh, et cetera. And lately, the, the fad with all the home shows and renovation shows that are on, uh, a lot of people are... Uh, looking at you know big windows, tall ceilings, without <coughs> really factoring in what those additional costs may be for operating a home uh, in the future. Um, so just a suggestion that um, you know partnering with with one of those um, home shows might be um, a way to really um, increase your exposure in terms of uh, of. Um, and, and maybe uh, increase awareness, uh, I think, for, from the public's point of view, because R2000 was a really, really big push, and, and then there was some pushback in terms of, uh, you know, some of the latest and greatest technologies of 1999, 2000, uh, didn't turn out all that well. Radiant heating in the ceiling, for example, was a bit of a bust. Uh, some um, providers were problematic. Um, but other things, such as you know, a, a well-sealed home, uh, made a big difference. So uh, it'd just be really neat to see some of it kind of come together. There's been a lot of different information over the years, and it seems like um, some of the lessons um, get lost over time. Yeah. Very good suggestion. Yeah. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Nolte. Uh, one quick question on your materials. 
Uh, it seems to be a rather short list. There's a lot of very common building materials missing from here. I'm thinking of stuff like hardy panel, which is cement, uh, fiber. I'm no nothing here about metal roofing or siding. Uh, right, so this was just a brief indication of a few of the materials that are out there. Um, it'll be fully more developed and there'll have to be a more uh, comprehensive list of the materials, but this is more of just a starting off point to say we're looking into materials to say which greenhouse gases are released from certain ones. Okay, now for my difficult question. Uh, <laughs> for the materials, did you take in lifetime costs and advantages? For example, cement siding will last forever. Wood siding will have to be replaced on a cyclical basis. Right, so this, uh, the study that we found that was mostly based off of uh, was mainly geared towards the manufacture of these materials, but the entire study was the life cycle analysis of them, so it did encompass um, the longevity of each of the materials as well. And one of the things, uh, I did a quite a bit of research into uh, concrete when we had uh, the concrete manufacturers come to council to make a presentation, and being familiar somewhat with the production of concrete, it generates a lot of greenhouse gas when they're killing it, using the kiln. But what they don't tell you is concrete actually sequesters carbon dioxide after it's poured. And so that's a lifetime advantage. And I was really surprised with how much it did uh, take out of the air as well. Any further questions? Thanks very much and look forward to your continued work. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Moving on to our agenda, nothing in correspondence this evening, so we'll move to new business, planning and land use committee, uh, item 6.1.1, recommendation on development variance permit application number DVP 17007 at for 1772 and 1778 Island Highway. Thank you, Worship. Here the applicant is requesting to vary section 12 of the Callwood sign bylaw number 60 in order to facilitate the installation of new signs for the existing A&W and Galaxy Motor businesses. The uh, applicant is requesting the following relaxations. Uh, it's actually an increase in the maximum number of freestanding signs per lot from one to two, an increase in the maximum number of fascia signs per business per building face from one to three, an increase of the maximum height of freestanding signs from six meters to eight meters, an increase in the total sign area for a freestanding sign from 15 square meters to 18.6 <laughs> square meters, and then finally an increase uh, to the maximum height of a fascia sign from 1.2 meters to 2.13 meters. As proposed that the, uh, uh, it was noted that the proposed signs are, are suited for the existing commercial uses and that the staff consider them uh, an improvement to the signs that they're uh, replacing. And they're pretty consistent with the existing oversized signage located in the area. Uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, the applicant didn't uh, attend the meeting and overall the committee had, uh, was quite supportive of um, the signage that would indicate where to get your mama and papa burgers, um, but were a little more um, uh, resistant or had some more concerns regarding the uh, Galaxy Motors uh, sign. That, that sign um, represented, although uh, lower in height, represented a, a quite a, a different look. Um, uh, from the existing sign that had a, a broader uh, impact on the form and character uh, and the um, visual identi uh, identity uh, from the street, as well as possibly affecting some um, surrounding signage from, uh, from other businesses. Uh, because the committee uh, was interested in, in supporting the business, uh, the ANW business, to move forward with their signage, um, and, uh, and for Galaxy Motors to report back to uh, the, the city uh, through staff on, on some options. Um, committee saw fit to actually uh, split the recommendation into two parts. First part, Your Worship, is, uh, is um, supporting staff's recommendation to move forward with the ANW signage. Uh, the second part of the recommendation where it starts with AND is um, basically uh, asking that the Galaxy Motors uh, sign be deferred so staff can work with the applicant uh, for, uh, uh, to uh, garner some more information. Um, again, the reason for a two-part motion was that we did not delay uh, the applicant with the A&W portion from uh, moving forward with, uh, with his updates. Uh, so seeing that, it was recommended uh, by committee and I so move the recommendation before us. 
discussion, Council? Councilor Day? I um, just wanted to uh, add that uh, I think that was uh, good that the committee would defer. There was a lot more information and sight lines uh, were very much more visible for the a &W sign, so you knew um, what it would look like and how it might impact the, the neighboring businesses. Whereas the, because the shape of the uh, Galaxy Motor sign was quite <coughs> different where it's now on a narrower pillar and then wider at the top, the proposed lower sign was wide all the way to the bottom. Um, so I think it would be very good to get a little bit more information and more idea what the views would be like um, on that one. So I definitely support the um, separation of, of the two signs because they are, although they're they're on one property, they're two distinct businesses. Councillor Nolt. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I appreciate those concerns and I too had the concerns with the Galaxy Motors sign going from nine square meters to 18 square meters. That's a, a rather large jump. The a and signs actually, all in all, are gonna be smaller than on the existing building. So I'm fully supportive of that in spite of the fact that they are higher than our sign bylaw requirement. Uh, <coughs> their last than is already there. So I will support that and I do agree that we should split the two and uh, discuss the Galaxy Motors uh, at a greater depth. Councillor Logan, will the deferred part go back to committee and then come back to council, or will it be back to council? Uh, it'll come back to committee. Okay, just want to check on that. Anybody else? With that, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, moving into finance and administration, 6.2.1, memo from the corporate communications manager, update on the new business license database. Thank you, Roger. <coughs> Um, we thought it was a good time to provide an update on the uh, business license database, which, as you know, um, in 2016, Council decided to eliminate annual business license fees um, as a first step toward encouraging business retention and expansion and uh, new business development. So now business owners pay a one-time fee when they first get a business license, and then there's an easy online free renewal process for them each year. And that process provides a touch point for the city to check in with the business, um, ensure they're in good standing, and, uh, and collect some data. So as you know, we, the city received an Order of the Bear um, Award from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. But the process really went so smoothly that um, you haven't heard much about it since then. So I just wanted to touch base. Um, most importantly, the process has provided some really good data that we haven't had before. Um, and so we have a report here um, that I wanted to provide and get your input uh, to know if there's any other data that would be um, interesting to you to, uh, to have reported. So we can report on the number of businesses, how they break down by whether they're, wh whether they're home-based business or commercial, whether they're intermunicipal or non-resident businesses. So we can break it down in a whole bunch of ways. The report I've provided um, does a couple of those things. It reports active businesses by category, which I just, just described. It also incorporates some qualitative data that we collected in the survey in 2016 of businesses, um, which was really very positive. And then it breaks it down by type of industry, which is, is kind of interesting. And we could slice that further by what types are home-based businesses and what types are commercial and, and, and do a lot more. So I just wanted to present this and also acknowledge the work of administrative staff who really had to touch every record a number of times in order to approve and um, verify the data. Um, so it's been a lot of work. And here we have some data for your review. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions to Sandra? Yep. Uh, thank you. Through the mayor. Uh, Sandra, how, how are we addressing, uh, like, I'm a lazy person, so if I, if I don't have to re renew my business license because there's no penalty for not doing it, how are we actually encouraging people to actually renew, even though like there's, since there's no cost, and it doesn't seem like there's any penalty or ramification for not renewing. Mm -hmm. So how are we not losing data that way? Right, so there's no penalty, but each year a letter will go to the businesses 
uh, informing them that they need to renew to keep their license in good standing. And if by, uh, I think we set a date of March 31st each year, if they haven't renewed, then Paul would, the, the business license officer will go out and pay them a visit and say hello and make sure they're still there and um, connect with them that way and, Great, and we'll get them all in line. Yeah. Your Worship? If, uh, and if a business is also delinquent in renewing their license, they eventually they're going to be forced with having to apply for a new license, which gets back into a fee and another bureaucratic process of uh, getting a business license. So the, the encouragement is to continue to do the online uh, renewal, which is simple and free, and mm -hmm. hopefully uh, it avoids any visits from staff and also ultimately avoids them having to reapply for a new license. Yep. Uh, just like uh, through the mayor, just as a clar clarification through our CAO, do, have we made a decision on what that time period is of, of like where, like how lax can they be before, before we say no, you got to pay the fee again? Your Worship, I, I believe it's uh, stated in the bylaw, but I don't recall it or I'd have to look oh. it up. Sandra, I for one would be interested in the breakdown on the um, home-based businesses mm -hmm. in Cullwood, so that might be something that we can look to targeting for the next yep, update. That would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, need a motion to receive? Move receive. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. And next item on there again, corporate communications in regards to Eats and Beats beach event update. <laughs> Again, I just wanted to provide an update about this event, which is uh, approaching quickly. Um, it happens Saturday, July 15th, down at the waterfront along Esplanade Lagoon. Um, and again, it's just a way to celebrate our waterfront, show it off to the whole region. Last year, it was a really popular event. We had close to 2,000 people, we think, um, and the weather wasn't all that great. So this year, hopefully, the weather will be great and it'll be um, even better. We've got, again, about 10 to 12 food trucks lined up, some different ones, some nice variety this year, some really local ones and, and some new flavors, uh, and some bands. We have the opportunity to get a few big names, especially with the demise of Rock the Shores this year. However, we would need sponsorship to do that, so we're talking to potential sponsors and looking at whether we can improve that. But we do have some really fun, upbeat bands that, that people always enjoy. So. Um, and a couple of new activities we're working on. Uh, the Vancouver Aquarium has an aqua van that comes around to events. And for Canada 150, they're um, going to 150 places. And ours is on the list. Um, they're trying to, because it's a Vancouver-based Vancouver um, service, they're trying to find another event on the island to um, bring down the cost a little bit of the ferry travel. But um, we are on their list, so I hope that's going to work. And that's just a, a marine biology sort of event where kids can go and, and anyone can go and, you know, pick up a live starfish and check out a sea urchin and learn about marine life. And it's a really neat place, I think, to do that right on our waterfront. The second one is um, a climbing wall, which is, um, they're actually well, well used. They're very safe. Um, they are staffed, so people get an orientation, and they have an auto belay system, so that you know if any if there's any threat of somebody letting go or jumping off or doing whatever, they're slowly released to the ground. So it's a safe event, but really fun and kind of a neat out outdoor outdoor activity. Um, so that's another one we're looking at. And then again, paddling uh, with Gyro Beach Board Shop. We'll have stand-up paddle boards, and people can kayak. Uh, driftwood art competition again with the West Shore Art Council helping us with that. Uh, CFB Esquimalt is going to have their fireboat out on the water doing displays, and they may even have some aerial exercise displays going on that day just so people can see stuff going on. West Shore Parks and Rec is doing a story walk so kids can walk along the beach and, and read a book as they go about marine life. Uh, the Greater Victoria Public Library is bringing their outreach vehicle. And uh, we'll do some OCP input, our official community plan, will gather some input from people again on the latest um, draft goals and directions. And the other exciting thing, we've got Royal Roads University people here. Uh, we're going to be partnering with the Royal Roads University School of Tourism and Hospitality. They'll be um, supplying some volunteers to get an event experience and tourism experience. So that's going to be a, a real big help, for one thing, to have extra hands on the ground and, uh, and a great partnership opportunity. 
Um, and the last thing I wanted to say was just if um, anyone has ideas for sponsorship, we're welcoming sponsors who would like to promote their business through this event. There'll be lots of um, online and paid advertising, print advertising, I should say, and uh, the radio station, 100.3 KISS, Kiss FM, no, 103.1 KISS FM, will be uh, broadcasting live from the event as well. So lots of opportunities for to showcase all that we do. Thank you. Okay. Do you have a, I know July 15th, you've got a time start end? Yeah, it starts later? at 1 p.m. and it goes till 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. Any questions, Cassandra, on this one? Uh, again, motion to receive. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks, Sandra. Busy, busy in your corner office there. Um, 6.2.3, Memorandum from Director of Admin, Proposed CRD Animal Control Services Agreement. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this item was last discussed by a City Council at their April 24th uh, regular meeting. At that time, uh, we advised Council that they had advised in June of 2016, or sorry, they directed in June of 2016, for staff to undertake a comparison of the two local animal control service providers uh, in order to come up with the next uh, four-year contract for animal control services. Uh, we did become aware, though, between that time and the April 24th meeting that it can't just be a comparison of the two <coughs> local service providers. It would actually have to be a full tender process. And it was suggested by staff at the time and supported by council that we use the sole source purchase clause of the city's purchasing power delegation bylaw. So at that meeting, council directed staff to enter into discussions with the CRD for a new animal control services agreement that would cover 2018 and 2019 with a two-year rate of renewal option for 2020 and 2021. The annual service fee for 2018 was to remain at the $62,400 that was already established in the current agreement that will expire next year, although the requirement to give notice takes place this year if we're not going to renew. Uh, the new agreement with the proposed fees is included in the agenda package for you. Uh, it, it's slightly less than a 2% increase over 2018 for 2019, 2020, and 2021. Um, I do have to mention that I made a mistake in my recommendation and there's a digit missing. It looks like we're getting $63.60 for 2019. It's actually $63,600. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so we better clear that up right away so we pass the right motion, hopefully, later th in the evening. One of the explanations from the CRD on the increases of slightly less than 2% is in the period of 2012 to 2016, with, which is a good portion of our last term of our contract, uh, wages went up 15.3%, veterinary expenses went up 139% because they had to pick up a lot of the uh, work with with respect to injured and stray animals that's no longer undertaken by the SPCA, and legal expenses increased by 50 point, excuse me, 50.5 percent, as well as the annual cost of living increases. So what we are proposing tonight, uh, based on the, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I meant to mention, the only changes to the past contract and the proposed contract, the terms of the agreement, of course, to reflect the new years, the right of renewal option to reflect the current years, which the right of renewal would be for 2020, 2021, and the call with covenants under Section 7, which lays out the fees for the four years of the proposed contract. So tonight we're asking Council to consider um, approving the contract as uh, provided in the package, um, to uh, approve the agreement with the two years and two year right of renewal. If you don't want to renew in the second two years, it's just a matter of giving notice and giving the mayor and chief administrative officer authority to sign the animal control services agreement. Thank you. I move the recommendation. Second. Discussion, questions, anyone? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Um, item 6.2.4, memo from Director of Finance in regards to the 2017 to 2021 financial plan amendment to change capital projects funding sources. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This report is being presented in conjunction with our CIO, um, and we have basically brought back to you uh, change 
in an abundance of caution to ensure that there is no delay going forward with a project we'd like to tender in the very near future on Mitchelson Road. This project was uh, authorized in the budget and there was some discussion at our April 24th council meeting. And that at that point in time, it had been brought to our attention by our new director of engineering that in the past, uh, some projects had been brought forward by previous staff members in that department funded from road DCCs and it was noted that they were not qualified. So at that point, we took those projects and showed them as being funded uh, from the um, different grants. And I also at that meeting did indicate that once our new director of engineering gets established in the position, I'm sure she will have further detailed input on those future projects. What you're seeing tonight is just basically an abundance of caution here. Uh, we may get the grant, but if we don't, we don't want the fact that it's not clearly shown as being available because our backup plan all along was to have funding from the community amenity reserve. We're switching it for now just to ensure that the money is readily available. Uh, with the current construction climate, I was noticing there's a lot of competition out there. I see the city of Victoria was tendering some bridges recently and there was a million dollars over on the tendering there. So we want to ensure that the, the way is smooth to get these this project underway. So basically this is just a bit of an introduction to the bylaw amendment that's coming forward later this evening. Councillor Day. Thank you. Um, I just wonder if you could refresh my memory because I uh, couldn't recall uh, what the balance was in the community amenity fund that we're taking the money from for this? Yeah, basically it was uh, just over a million dollars and we are projecting significant um, monies to be coming into that fund over the next several years due to the development that's happening in Colwood. And um, I believe we have had a list of uses for community amenity funds before. Um, I'm just wondering how broad its, its reach is. Yes, very good question. I did review the bylaw and it is extremely broad. It basically says that it funds any project that is of uh, benefit to the community. Like it's, yeah. So uh, I, I'm, I'm only asking uh, because having been here as long as I have, I recall uh, that the Community Amenity Fund was uh, at one point in time envisioned for potential uh, fire hall expansion needs as well. So I just want to make sure that we're not draining the pot and I see that we're not. So I uh, just want to check those things out. Any other questions? Councillor Martin. Thank you. <coughs> um, I, and this is just helping me with math. Uh, so our third paragraph of the report basically says, you know, the Mitchelson Road was 911,000. <coughs> and then the financial plan is funded by 565 from federal conditional grants and 346,000 from gas tax revenue. Uh, then in the motion, or the effect of the proposed revision at the back, or number one, is that decreased revenue of government transfers of 625,000. And I'm just trying to understand where the 625 is coming from. Sure. 565. Sure. So the project was 911,000. A portion of that is to come from gas tax. That hasn't changed. Right. So the only funding source that we're making the switch on is that portion, 565,000. Added to that, we did find that we had another smaller project in there, which I mentioned in my report for 60,000. Again, we're just being cautious. And the 60 plus the 565 gives you the 625,000. Councillor Logan. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, uh, through you to the director. Um, do, you, do we know when we expect to hear uh, whether we're successful or not um, in the grant? And uh, the timing wouldn't screw us up if uh, we had started the project and then. Um, I'm going to defer that to our CAO because I know our director of engineering has been working on that. Yeah, Your Worship, the, um, the uh, I just want to get the wording right. I think it was a strategic uh, initiatives uh, fund. Has um, language in it that we're not used to 
in the past where it used to be that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't commence a project until you'd received approval of the grant. Uh, we've uh, double checked this before this report came forward that as long as we have received notice of receipt of the grant application that we could proceed with uh, tendering the project. So uh, at this point, the priority was make sure we've got the budget funds in place uh, before we tender. And, um, and this proposed motion to amend the bylaw will give us that authority to have the, the funding in place to do the tendering. And then if uh, we get the grant money, then we just won't draw down the reserves. Right. Do we know when they're going to make the announcement then? Uh, well, I would suspect it? that uh, I think it's UBCM that's making this decision, <laughs> but uh. they usually are impacted by the election because I think they are using um, provincial resources for the evaluation. I'm not certain of that, but I suspect that the, the um, election is going to slow things down a bit. Fair enough. Thank you. That clarified for me. Um, anybody else? Uh, so we have a need a m recommendation here, folks. Any further questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Um, moving into just double checking bylaws. Item number 7.1, bylaw number 1667, third reading only. Call with land use bylaw number 151-1989, amendment number 158 for 2006 Souk Road. Move third reading, Your Worship. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, 7.2, bylaw number 1668, third reading as amended. Move third as amended, Your Worship. Second. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carried. Bylaw number 1678, third reading only. Um, is that? Mm -hmm. It's fine. I need somebody to move it. Second it. Second. Discussion? Thank you. Uh, uh, th through the mayor to our uh, director of planning, uh, public hearing wise, uh, the person did mention about the fact that. Uh, yeah, the home-based business versus secondary suites and that they can't do both at the same time. Uh, does staff see us addressing that issue anytime soon? Uh, Your Worship, yes. <coughs> staff is interested in providing a global review of all the regulations. This bylaw uh, simply takes away the permitting requirements beyond a building permit. Uh, but certainly that is something we want to look at in terms of how we coordinate with uh, home-based business licensing. Um, the issue, um, I think, that the, the speaker at the public hearing uh, was bringing to bear was the regulations that restrict a home-based business that has the potential to generate traffic and the parking demands that that create relative to uh, secondary suite parking demands. Um, currently, you can have a secondary suite and a home-based business that doesn't generate traffic. So that's the issue um, right now. And that stems to my question around identifying what the differences in home-based businesses are to try and get our heads around that. So any other questions on this one? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Um, 7.4, bylaw number 1690, first, second, and third readings for the five-year financial plan. Uh, bylaw number 1673, amendment number one, schedule A and B. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move second. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, 7.5, final reading for bylaw number 1679, Callwood, Maine, Sewer Local Area Service Bylaw Establishment. Uh, bylaw number 598, 2001, amendment number 55 for 3331 Wishart Road. Move final, Your Worship. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. 
Uh, item 7.6, bylaw number 1680, final reading, Callwood West, sewer, local areas, service establishment, and loan, bylaw num or amendment number 42, 4331 Wishart Road. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, 7.7, first, second, and third readings for bylaw number 1683, Callwood, Main, sewer, local area, service, bylaw bylaw establishment and loan authorization number 598 amendment number 56 for 3134 Machosen Road moving to that one. second all those in favor opposed motion carried move second yeah. any discussion all those in favor opposed motion carries move third all those in favor opposed motion carried uh, bylaw number, or 7.8, bylaw number 1684, again, first, second, and third readings for Colwood Central Sewer lo Local Area Service and Bylaw, uh, Service Establishment and Loan Authorization Bylaw, Amendment <coughs> number 843134, Machosen Road. I'd like to move the introduction, please. All those in favor? Second. Opposed? <laughs> Motion carried. Any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move third. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, 7.9, and finally on our agenda for this evening, regular council meeting, bylaw number 1686, first, second, and third readings. Again, Colwood, Main Sewer, local area service, bylaw establishment and loan authorization number 598, amendment number 57 for 3116 Wishart Road. Move introduction. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move second. Discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Motion please to go in camera. So moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. 